All right. The next session we're going to do is an overview of the New Testament. And I hope that just these overview sessions are helpful for you. I know for both my wife and I, they've been really helpful just in terms of seeing the big picture of the scripture. I heard one instructor, I think, call it uh, the Bible from 30,000 feet. And uh, I know it's been helpful for us just in our own devotional life. It's been helpful as we've been leading some small group Bible studies to just give this big picture overview of the scriptures so that when you're kind of digging into one particular book, you have a better understanding for how that book or that section of verses fits into the overarching narrative of the scriptures. So we're going to dig into the overview of the New Testament starting at number 13. Number 13 says that the New Testament consists of 27 books written by the early followers of Christ. So the Old Testament had 39 books. The New Testament has 27 books. These 27 books, number 14, these 27 books of the New Testament are divided into five historical books, 21 epistles. Epistle is just another word for letter. So 21 epistles, and then one prophetic book. And if you remember the acronym AMPEC from the previous sessions, that from Genesis to Malachi is the anticipation of Christ. Then when you look at the Gospels, you have the, the manifestation of Christ. You get into the book of Acts, and we look at the proclamation of Christ. Then in the epistles or the letters, we have the explanation of Christ. And finally, in the book of Revelation, we have the consummation of Christ. So even as we walk through the New Testament in this overview, you need to fix it again. As we walk through this overview, I want you to keep in mind that AMPEC, those five Christ-centered divisions as we walk through the New Testament. We'll start with the Gospels. The Gospels are the manifestation of Christ. Number 15, the Gospels present Jesus Christ from the unique perspective of four different authors who are writing to four different audiences, together presenting a compelling, complementary, not contradictory picture of Jesus. The Gospels are four different, written by four different authors to four different audiences, and together they tell a complementary story of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus' person and his work were so big and so massive that four different men wrote accounts of him that were complimentary and that showed different perspectives of his life and ministry. And I just want to walk through each of these, uh, each of these different authors and these different Gospels. The first is the, the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew was written primarily to a Jewish audience. If you remember in Matthew chapter 1, in the genealogy that Matthew lists, he says that Jesus was the son of Abraham and that Jesus was the son of David. So right away he's drawing this connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament, showing that Jesus is the Messiah that they've been waiting on. That Jesus is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, which was listed in Genesis 12 and Genesis 15 and other places. And that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant that's listed in 2 Samuel 7. And over and over throughout the Gospel of Matthew, you see him referring back and quoting Old Testament scriptures, drawing the connection between the two. Matthew's emphasis is on the teaching ministry of Jesus. He gives a systematic account of the teachings of Jesus with the kingdom of God as the emphasis of much of his teaching. Now, contrary to Matthew, Mark emphasizes not the teaching ministry of Jesus, but rather the miraculous ministry of Jesus. Mark wrote to a primarily Roman audience. And one of Mark's favorite phrases was immediately. And immediately they did this. And then immediately they did that. Because he was emphasizing this action of Jesus. The miraculous, active ministry of Christ. Not only that, but Mark tells the story of Jesus as a suffering servant. And he challenges us as disciples of Christ, if we are going to follow Jesus, then we too must expect to suffer. We too must expect to suffer as we lay our lives down as servants. 
The Gospel of Luke is the only Gospel that's written by a Gentile author. Luke was a Gentile physician. He was a travel companion of the Apostle Paul. And Luke, it's interesting, Luke wrote both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. And he wrote both of these books to Theophilus. And it's just evident in Luke's writing that he loved Theophilus, and really these letters were written to disciple Theophilus, to teach him about the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so as the Gentile author, Luke writes this gospel, and he emphasizes that the gospel is for all people, that the gospel is both for Jews and for Gentiles. But not only is the gospel for all ethnic groups, but he also proclaims the gospel as good news to the poor and to the downcast and to the leper and to women and to anyone whom society would deem or would put on the margin. Luke emphasizes that the gospel is good news for all, both ethnically and socioeconomically. The gospel of John is a unique gospel. In fact, 92% of the gospel of John is unique compared to the other three. In Matthew and in Luke, you have a genealogy at the beginning of the books that's more of a human genealogy. But in the Gospel of John, it opens up with John 1.1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so John emphasizes just the exalted person and work of Jesus Christ. The Gospel of John includes the seven I am statements of Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the gate. I am the bread of life. And also emphasizes seven miracles of Jesus. John 20, 31 kind of lays out the theme of the Gospel of John. It says, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So those are the four Gospels. And for the storyline of the New Testament, it's interesting that the four Gospels and the book of Acts include the entire storyline of the New Testament. All of the other letters and the book of Revelation fit in to that storyline. And so you have the Gospels and the book of Acts that tell the storyline of the New Testament. Number 16, it says that the book of Acts records the works of the ascended Jesus through his spirit in the lives of the early church as the gospel spread to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth through the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. And you'll notice that number 16 refers to Acts 1.8. In Acts 1.8, before the ascension of Christ, Jesus said to them, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem and to Judea and to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And Acts 1.8 really serves as an outline for the entire book of Acts. Now I want to take a look at that and see how it breaks down. You've got some charts on your handout that kind of break down the book of Acts in some different ways. I want to walk through one of those ways. He says that you will take the gospel to Jerusalem, and in Acts 1 through 7, the early church remained in the city of Jerusalem. They didn't go anywhere for those first seven chapters. But then in Acts chapter 7, something happened. We have the first martyr. Stephen was stoned. And after the stoning of Stephen in Acts 8, uh, chapter 8, verse 1, it says that a great persecution arose against the church. And as this persecution arose, it scattered the followers of Jesus. And it says in Acts 8, 1, that the disciples, that the twelve, remained in Jerusalem, but that many of the other believers were scattered out. And so what Jesus had told them in Acts 1, 8, began to take shape in Acts 8, 1. And so from chapters 8 to 12 of the book of Acts, you see the gospel expanding from the city of Jerusalem to Judea, which was the region that surrounded the city of Jerusalem, to Samaria, which was the area just to the north of Judea. And so in Acts chapters 8 through 12, we have the gospel expanding to Judea and Samaria. 
Then in chapters 13 through the end of the book, we begin to see that the gospel is going to the ends of the earth. So the gospel spreads not only from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, but up into Galatia, and up into Macedonia, and down into Greece, and over, even all the way over to Rome. And so we see this gospel expansion, this multiplication of the gospel as the disciples make disciples who make disciples. Now, Paul, number 17, I'm going to read it and then we'll unpack it together. Number 17 says, while Paul's 13 letters are placed from longest to shortest in our Bible, they are better understood in their proper historical context. And so I want to walk through Paul's missionary travels, and then I want to help us place where these different Pauline epistles, the epistles, uh, the epistles that Paul wrote, I want to show you how they fit in to the story of the book of Acts. And so we have in Acts chapter 13, we have a, a church, a key church in the city of Antioch. Prior to chapter 13 and the end of chapter 11, it says that the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. And at Antioch, you had this multi-ethnic church that had formed there. And that would be the first missionary sending church that's record, recorded in the scriptures. In chapter 13, it says that they were gathered and that they were worshiping and that they were fasting and that they, led, they laid their hands on Paul and Barnabas and they sent them out from the church in Antioch. And so their first missionary journey, I'm going to trace it with this red marker, they left Antioch. It was Paul and Barnabas and John Mark they went to the island of Cyprus, did some evangelism on Cyprus, headed up to the city of Perga. Then from Perga, they traveled north to Pisidian Antioch, over to Iconium, down to Lystra, where it got pretty serious as Paul was almost stoned to death. They would get up and go down to the city of Derbe. Then they would go back to each of those cities even to dangerous places, to encourage and strengthen the churches. And then from Perga, they would sail back to Antioch. Now, when they got back to Antioch, they began to get word that the churches that were in the region of Galatia were beginning to turn away from the gospel. We're told in the book of Galatians, that there were other teachers who came in. And so Paul from Antioch wrote the book of Galatians to the Galatian believers to encourage them to not depart from the gospel. If you turn with me to Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, it says this. It says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one. And then if you go down to verse 9, it says, As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. And so throughout the book of Galatians, Paul is defending the one and only true gospel of Jesus Christ. And so in Acts 13 and 14, we see the first missionary journey. And after he returned from the first missionary journey, the book of Galatians was written. Now, after the first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas returned to the other believers and to the other church leaders, and they were encouraged and they were excited that, the God, that God was beginning to open up the door of the gospel to the Gentiles. That Gentiles were coming to put their faith in Christ. And what began was a bit of a debate because this new Gentile thing was new to the church. They hadn't seen this type of gospel expansion before. And so they got into a debate as to whether Gentile believers and Gentile converts should then be circumcised. And they, they kind of had this healthy argument about this issue, and what they came to conclude was this, that God was doing a unique work amongst the Gentiles and that they would not require the Gentiles to be circumcised, but rather that they would just encourage them to believe on the gospel 
and to live according to the scriptures. So that was an important thing to fix in the early church to make sure that they were making the main thing the main thing. After the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15, we have the second missionary journey, which started in Acts chapter 16. At the end of chapter 15, though, there was a disagreement between Paul and between Paul and Barnabas. You see, on the first missionary journey, John Mark had deserted Paul and Barnabas, and he had headed back. And so Paul did not want to take John Mark on this second missionary journey. Barnabas, being known as the son of encouragement, he wanted to bring John Mark, and so it says that a sharp disagreement arose between them. So Barnabas and Mark left from Antioch, and they sailed to Cyprus. Paul took with him Silas and headed out on the second missionary journey. This time he would head back into Galatia to the different churches that they had planted in Derby, Lystra, and Iconium. They would visit here and, and strengthen and encourage the churches. While they were in Lystra this time, Paul wanted to take a young disciple by the name of Timothy with them. Timothy, this would begin this discipleship relationship between Paul and Timothy. They would go back to Pisidian Antioch. They would travel. They would like to go to Ephesus, but the Holy Spirit directed otherwise. They head up to Troas. In Acts chapter 16, they get the Macedonian call. They see this vision of a man in Macedonia saying, please come and help us. And so they head up into Macedonia to Philippi, to Thessalonica, down through Berea, to Athens, and finally all the way down to the city of Corinth. While they're in Corinth, Paul sends Timothy back to check on the believers in, Thessal in Thessalonica. He gets a good report, and he writes the letter of 1 Thessalonians to encourage the believers there. Then later on, he discerns that the believers in Thessalonica have some different questions and issues that they're wrestling through. So Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians from the city of Corinth. After that, they would travel back across to the city of Ephesus. And from Ephesus, they would travel all the way back down to the city of Jerusalem. The second missionary journey occurs in Acts 16 through 18. And during the second missionary journey, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians were written. That brings us to the third missionary journey. From the third missionary journey, they would travel back up to Antioch. And once again, Antioch would be their departure point. They would travel back up to those familiar cities, once again encouraging and strengthening the believers, back through Pisidian Antioch, but this time the Holy Spirit gave them the clearance to travel to Ephesus. They would spend two years in Ephesus just pouring their lives into the believers there and establishing a church. From the city of Ephesus, though, they began a, a significant correspondence with the believers and with the church at Corinth, known as the Corinthian correspondence. And in the book of 1 Corinthians, it references a previous letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. We don't have it in our Bibles other than that it's mentioned in 1 Corinthians. And so from Ephesus, Paul would write a first a letter, a previous letter to Corinth. Then he would write the book of 1 Corinthians. After he wrote the book of 1 Corinthians, they would make a painful visit to Corinth, then they would travel back to Ephesus. He would write another letter to the Corinthians, a sorrowful letter. And from there, they would travel up back into Macedonia. And somewhere, as they were traveling through Macedonia, Paul would write 2 Corinthians to the church in Corinth. They would come back into Macedonia, down through Greece again, back to Corinth. And it was while Paul was in Corinth that he wrote the book of Romans. From Corinth, because of just dangerous threats and attacks being made, they decided to travel back through 
Macedonia to Thessalonica, up to Philippi, over to Troas. And this time, they would bypass Ephesus and go to a city of Miletus on the southern coast, and then finally back to Jerusalem. So the third missionary journey happened in Acts 19 through 21. And on the third missionary journey, he wrote 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Romans. Shortly after that, Paul was arrested for preaching the gospel and for telling people the good news about Jesus Christ. He was put in a Roman, or not in a Roman prison, but he was put in prison in Jerusalem. And from Acts 22 to 26, he went from one court to the next, from one government official to the next. And finally, he appealed all the way to Caesar in Rome. In Acts chapter 27, we're told of the journey that he would take from the city of Jerusalem as he traveled across the sea to the city of Rome. And in Acts chapter 28, he finally makes it to Rome. He's put into a prison in Rome, and while he's in prison, he would write four epistles. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. It's interesting if you think about that, some of those different letters. You think of Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, where Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That Paul wrote that letter from a jail cell in Rome. And he was talking about how throughout his journeys, throughout his life, throughout his walk with Christ, through the highs and through the lows, he had found the secret of contentment, of being content in Christ and even from a jail cell. He could write, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So the fourth missionary journey, which is really his prison sentence, comes in the last chapters of the book of Acts. And from prison, he would write Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and the letter of Philemon. Then history tells us that he was released from the Roman prison and he would do a little bit of traveling. He spent time with a key disciple on the island of Crete named Titus. And that's where he wrote the book of Titus to his disciple on Crete. He would spend some time with his son in the faith, Timothy, in the city of Ephesus. And shortly after that, he would pen the first epistle that he wrote to Timothy known as 1 Timothy. Then, as history tells us, he would be arrested again, and he would be taken back to Rome. This time, the prison sentence was more severe. It was a more... Uh, it was just a different type of prison, and Paul could tell that death was imminent. And from the prison in Rome, he wrote the second epistle to Timothy in Ephesus. It's interesting, at the end of his life, he reaches out to his son in the faith to encourage him. You think of 2 Timothy chapter 2 where Paul says, You then, my son, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Then he says, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So in the same way that Christ, at the end of his life, gave his last words to the disciples and encouraged them to make disciples, Paul from a Roman prison with death on the horizon, reached out to his son in the faith and encouraged Timothy to give his life to making disciples. So that's how the different Pauline epistles fit into the storyline of the book of Acts. In some ways, God helped us out because after the first missionary journey, he wrote one epistle. During the second missionary journey, he wrote two epistles. During the third missionary journey, he wrote three epistles. And during the fourth missionary journey, which was his prison sentence, he wrote four epistles. Now, number 18 on your handout, it says that the general epistles are so named because they are, for the most part, not addressed to specific audiences, 
but they might better be called non-Pauline epistles. The non-Pauline books are Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, and Jude. And so you have general epistles that are not written by the Apostle Paul, and then you have the Pauline epistles. And the Pauline epistles, the titles of the book, or the titles of the letters, are named after whom Paul was writing to. But with the general epistles, typically they're named after the author. So 1st and 2nd Peter were, were written by Peter. 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John was written by John. The exception to that would be the book of Hebrews, and scholars are uncertain. There's no clear author to the book of Hebrews. Finally, the final book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, it records the vision of Jesus, which John saw in the first chapter, Jesus' letters to the seven churches of John's day in Revelations chapter 2 and 3. And then finally, the things that will take place in the future, Revelation 4 through 22. And so we see, uh, as we trace through the New Testament, the Gospels, the manifestation of Christ, the book of Acts, which is the proclamation of Christ, the epistles, the letters which is the explanation of Christ, and then Revelation, which finally is the consummation of Christ. Just want to encourage you uh, to really give yourselves to the studies of the, to study the scriptures. Uh, there's a, a little uh, thing that's helpful for that, number 20, that says the Bible is to be heard, read, studied, memorized, and meditated on for a lifetime. The Bible is to be heard. That is to, to get to a church on a regular basis where there is good, solid biblical preaching and to hear the Word of God or to go to a Bible study so that the Bible can be heard. The Bible is to be read, to spend devotional time in the Word, to read it, to read through a book at a time, just to, to glean through it. The Bible is to be studied. That is to get a good study Bible if you can and spend some time digging into maybe a, a smaller section of verses and really study. Study what the words mean. Study the historical context. Study the cultural context. Study the theology of the Bible. The Bible is to be memorized. So take verses or maybe a few verses or maybe a chapter of the Bible and commit them to memory so that not only do you have it memorized up here but it begins to transform your heart and then finally to meditate on the word to take a verse or a small section of verse and just to continuously chew on it and think on it throughout the day to spend some time in silence before God just thinking on the scripture so heard read studied memorized and meditated and it just allows you to palm or to grip the Bible well. I would encourage you to use this stuff. Uh, use it at home if you have kids to teach your kids the Bible. Uh, use it within your local churches. Maybe if you're able to teach a Sunday school class or lead a small group. Use it with the people that you're discipling. But also as you're having your devotional time and as you're reading through the scriptures personally, refer back to it. Think about the big uh, picture. Think about the map. Think about the eras of the New Testament. Think about the five Christ-centered divisions. Think about the missionary journeys of Paul and how the letters fit into that. Because it will transform your personal study of the Scriptures, but I just really encourage you to be a lifelong student of the Word.